Hello, good morning. Hello, can you hear me? Good morning. Yes, good morning. Very good. Morning. Very wonderful. Let's wait for a few more minutes and we'll start. Hello, only five of us. Someone has disconnected. Okay, let's probably start. Uh, good morning once again. Uh, so you remember where we stopped last time. I first of all must apologize that there was no lecture on Monday. I first decided to do it in the recorded format, but then realized that it would be better to do it live, as we do now. Uh, never mind. So today we'll cover uh, the remaining topics of uh, that lecture and we'll go into our new stuff uh, regarding general architectures of uh, distributed ledger systems we have now started bitcoin so we know how it works we'll be able to generalize uh, to generalize that and uh, in particular we'll be interested in uh, interactive consistency uh, protocols also called uh, consensus uh, protocols uh, how it works 
okay uh, so uh, can you hear me can everyone hear me could you please confirm yes yep okay fine now <clears throat> let us recall where we stopped last time we have discussed all the details of bitcoin blockchain implementation apart from the details of how actually consistency between the nodes is achieved we mentioned uh, some general ideas so for example we described proof of work uh, in the bitcoin network but uh, let us see exactly uh, what happens uh, and uh, in particular how inconsistencies or differences between the nodes are resolved that's very important and uh, this provides one example of uh, the general consensus protocol uh, there are many variations of it uh, as used in modern real-time systems and in particular in uh, distributed ledger systems so <clears throat> Uh, suppose that there is a node okay uh, there is a certain node you can see the screen right uh, let's say node one so what does it have it had the chain of already available blocks which was uh, uh, either recorded in this node from the beginning or received somehow from other nodes when uh, the node one uh, node one was initialized. So upon initialization, it is receiving uh, previous nodes up to the full depth actually or full height. Let's see. So that the full height of the current blocks. <clears throat> so these are these are blocks replicated across nodes and therefore they are stored within node one as well <clears throat> then uh, as we remember uh, there is a certain api uh, which allowed the user to submit new transactions for example locally uh, into this node so new transactions are coming in also new transactions are coming from other nodes because once a transaction is received here the first thing which uh, this node would do it would broadcast pending transactions to other node to other nodes and in general we would say that the time required for transactions to reach other nodes well how much this time could be even for very remote nodes for example one in moscow and another one in new zealand what do you think is the typical broadcast time uh, for a transaction to reach uh, another node roughly how long does it take Uh, what is the typical ping time over internet uh, if you have very very remote counterparty so you are pinging a computer in the united states in australia somewhere just long distance have you noticed actually typical long distance ping time by the way that's double time it's around trip from your computer For example, here, Moscow or Annapolis, some remote server, and back. So what is this ping time typically? Did you notice it? Well, uh, have you, uh, I'm absolutely sure you have, uh, been using the ping uh, command in Linux? I will tell you that a typical ping time 
is still under one second. So it could be even for a very remote server, it could be, let's say, of the range, uh, let's say, 300 milliseconds, double trip, round trip. Normally not more, something like that. And the average time between a new block is hashed in uh, our Bitcoin network is obviously 10 minutes, which is 600 seconds. In that case, uh, we may hope that before actually a new block is constructed, uh, on average, uh, the nodes would be able to build some kind of consistent queue of incoming transactions. So here, for both actually transactions, uh, which are inserted locally, and the transactions coming from other nodes, through this peer-to-peer -peer communication, not only we broadcast our new transaction to all other nodes, but we receive those broadcasts as well. So then inside the node, there is also a queue of transactions, pending transactions, which are not yet put into any block. So what would the node do? It would take transactions from this queue and build a candidate block, a new block, which contains, uh, depending on uh, the direction in which this queue is growing, suppose that it is growing into this direction. In that case, it takes some number of oldest transactions uh, in the queue and putting them into the block. So, okay, this is a candidate block. But in general, it doesn't need to be a list of all the transactions. Actually, the node is absolutely free to select whatever transaction they want from, from the queue. Do you remember uh, which very important criteria a node would typically use in order to uh, select transactions to be put into the block. It's definitely not, uh, well, usually not, I would say, a five for first in, first out. There are some priorities. The one who paid the most of the fee will be the first. Yes. Priorities based on transaction fees, indeed. And because on average, all nodes would have a more or less same, let's say, queue of transactions uh, with the same, obviously, proposed fees, we can expect that, uh, although this is not guaranteed, but uh, we would expect that on average, uh, different nodes would compose a roughly similar candidate blocks out of those transactions. Although it is not at all guaranteed and it is not even required actually. Uh, but on average, we would assume that uh, there is some similarity. We do not require consistency here a similarity uh, between the transactions uh, which most nodes would put in a candidate block. Although uh, it is quite possible that, for example, there is a certain altruistic node uh, which would, uh, on the contrary, uh, select zero fee transactions and put them in a candidate block. That's also possible. So there is a candidate block which, for the moment, is local to this node one and it is not part of the blockchain at all. So what would node one try to do? When 
when there are sufficient transactions, <coughs> uh, sufficient transactions to fill uh, this candidate block, we remember that the maximum block size is one megabyte. Typical block size is about 250K, something like that, uh, which uh, amounts to roughly how many transactions on average uh, in a block? Roughly 1,000. A single transaction is about 250 bytes. Uh, the average block size is about 250K. So on average 1,000 transactions. What uh, would node one try to do then? It would try to, obviously this candidate block is referring to the topmost uh, block, the existing one in the blockchain. So it will now try to hash the candidate block. At the same time, there is a node two. Okay, there is a node two, which let's say would have same chain of existing blocks. Same as a node one. That's our initial assumption but it would have possibly a slightly different uh, queue of pending transactions, maybe same, maybe not. And it would try to build its own candidate block. But most likely, uh, this new candidate block would consist of a roughly same uh, transactions as a node one, maybe with some differences, but typically it would be very, very close to that. And it is also trying to hash it. How do we hash a block? You remember that um, it needs to compute a hash value which is less than the threshold. And the threshold is determined by uh, actually the difficulty uh, which is automatically adjusted in order to, uh, in order to uh, provide enough work for all nodes before a block could be hashed. We have seen in the previous example in a previous lecture that in general on average uh, each node mining node so this is a mining node which really performs hashing hashing and mining is the same thing so mining node mining node one mining node two we have seen an example that on average do you remember how much time would it be uh, would it be required for each node uh, to uh, come uh, with a successful hash? A successful hash occurs, we computed it last time, on average of once over 70 days. So what does it mean? It means that It means that uh, there is a variable field which is called, you remember, nonce. Uh, and actually, it is nowadays composed to several fields because a single 32 bit nonce is not long enough uh, to uh, provide actually enough work uh, for for hashing. It may very well be that if it is 32 bit, then you run through all 32 bit values from zero to two, uh, well, if unsigned, uh, four billion, and you would still not get uh, the overall hash value less than the threshold, simply because it doesn't occur. 
the first hold is already low enough and uh, even by altering uh, altering uh, these nodes through all values from 0 to 2 to the power 32 minus 1 which is roughly 4 billion values if you remember you would not get the hash below the threshold as dictated by uh, the difficulty the current difficulty required uh, in that case, uh, some other extensions uh, of the nonce field are permitted, apart from, for example, apart from nonce itself, uh, you can tweak a little bit the timestamp, and uh, you can tweak some other fields which are nonce extensions. 32-bit are not enough yet. So I would like to dwell on this a little bit more, so uh, you understand that uh, with all fields of a block given there is only one hash value right hashing is a deterministic function so if we take a block as it is compute a hash then we get a certain deterministic 160 bit hash value right uh, which is with all probability because it is uniformly distributed between zero and 2 to the power 160 minus 1 uniformly distributed between 0 and 2 to 160 minus 1 for example um, it is extremely unlikely that a given hash value will be less than the threshold extremely unlikely but in order to hash a block successfully you do need a value less than the threshold what do you do you are allowed just by the protocol by uh, by the bitcoin network uh, protocol to alter some fields of your block obviously not transactions but some service fields of the block and try again so one field which is uh, allowed to be altered is presenting this nonce which is developed uh, precisely for that purpose so you can set whatever value you want between zero and the maximum available value because it is only 32 bit so you run you run you run you run through all those values and it may very well be that unfortunately you still did not arrive at a value less than the threshold okay then you are allowed to alter some other fields uh, for example a little bit alter timestamp if you do it too much uh, then uh, the resulting block will not be accepted by other uh, nodes by your peers simply because the timestamp would be far out of a range and there are some other extensions for example extended nonce uh, field so altogether you can alter them and for the moment they do provide enough variability i would say so enough values to alter in order to eventually run into uh, the hash which is less than the threshold if you have done it before anyone else had done it then you have successfully uh, you have successfully uh mind uh, well hashed uh the block uh as a bonus you would receive currently 6.25 btc plus of course all transaction fees which come to you for successful mining uh by the way uh let's see what is greater so we say uh, roughly there are 1000 transactions and uh, we remember that the fees as calculated uh, they are uh, in it's very difficult to say uh, in general how much because the fees are typically uh, calculated per uh, per byte size 
rather than uh, per uh, monetary value of a transaction. Let's say, for example, the fees are 10 satoshi, just for, for, for the sake of the argument, 10 satoshi per byte, something like that. And if it is 250 bytes in the transactions, then it is uh, therefore 2,500 satoshi, uh, which is 2.5 10 to power 3, 10 to power minus 8, which is uh, 2.5 uh, 10 to uh, minus 5 over BTC. For the sake of the argument, let's say uh, it would be slightly more than that. Uh, let's say you receive, um, you receive, uh, for example, 10 to minus 4 BTC on average per transaction. Okay, suppose that. And there are 1,000 transactions typically here. So eventually for fees, you only receive a very, very unoptimistic value of 0 0.1 BTC. So this 6.25 plus a meager value of 0 0.1 BTC. Mm, not so good, all right? 6.35. And as we already know, this value of 6.25 is deliberately halved after a certain number of blocks have been hashed. And that happens on average, uh, well, the previous one, uh, previous halving was uh, the latest one uh, in May this year, uh, the previous one about three years ago. So eventually, uh, in the next century, this will drop below one Satoshi, so it will be absolutely, absolutely zero. But transaction fees are always going to be present. So even when all Bitcoins are mined, the miners would still continue to exist. Well, provided, obviously, that this technology is still in place by then. The miners would continue to exist and they would make their living only by this tiny fraction of BTCs uh, made from transaction fees, not from mining the block itself. So, okay. Uh, suppose that uh, typically because mining takes long time, it would typically happen that yes, there was one clear leader in this uh, consensus protocol, which really had mined the candidate block first. So suppose that yes, node number one had won this race and encountered a nonce so that uh, the hash is less than the threshold. Congratulations to node one. So what would node one do then? It would immediately send this new block to all peers. Uh, it would take a short while. A block is not that small. Uh, and there would be, for example, 10,000 uh, peers. Okay. So the block size is 2.5 uh, 10 to power 5 bytes on average, you remember, when uh, 250 kilobytes times, uh, let's say, 10 to power 4 peers. Therefore, you need to send uh, about 2.5 gigabyte of data. Okay, sending 2.5 gigabyte of data around to all peers would normally take, suppose that uh, you are 
connected to some kind of internet backbone and uh, this internet backbone let's say is one gigabit per second which is 0 0.5 gigabyte per second therefore it will take about 25 seconds to reach all other nodes uh, roughly 25 seconds okay now what may happen it may happen that no other block would have successfully mined their own i mean hashed and has their own candidate block no, no other node would have hashed uh, another block and in that case the block proposed by node one is a clear leader so this block proposed by node one arrives at node two okay so what would node two do node two is still in progress of hashing its own candidate block what do you think node two would do in this case Please give me an idea. What would Node 2 do? Well, for Node 2, there is no point anymore to continue with its own candidate block. No point because you can't really predict how long it would take you don't really know whether just you know one second remains so many more or much more probably much more because on average uh, you can only win once in 70 days and therefore no two by protocol definition would abandon its own candidate block abandon when new block from node one is received does it mean that all transactions uh, which were put into the candidate block from the queue <clears throat> are unsuccessful yes and no for the moment yes they assume to be unsuccessful and they are put back into the queue because the candidate block didn't succeed for node 2 but then node 2 puts this new block received from node 1 on top of the blockchain so that's the new block and now starts examining this block <clears throat> and actually it finds that because most of the candidate transactions were common between all blocks so they were distributed and sent to all blocks before uh, actually hashing starts that the majority of transactions are already in the new block so for those transactions which are already in the new block node 2 would remove them from their own queue and obviously node 1 would do the same for transactions which are successfully hashed into a new block put into a new block which was successfully hashed then those transactions are eliminated from the queue and it would happen that really the majority of transactions pending in each node would nevertheless be successfully uh, put into the new block no matter actually who hashed this new block and this is a very good thing because otherwise uh, you know your transactions can really wait for 70 days before being hashed successfully you certainly don't want that okay so that happens that happens if node 2 really abandons uh, its own candidate block and accepts a block from node 1 <clears throat> but now another possibility may occur so there would be node 3 which 
does its own mining. Okay, some node three. So there was again same initial blockchain as before, some kind of queue and its own candidate block. And now node three had also succeeded in hashing this candidate block before actually it would receive a block from node one. Why? Because we know that in general, it would take about 25 seconds, possibly more for uh, blocks, for, for, for the new block from node one to successfully reach all other blocks. So block one had succeeded, but in those 25 seconds, when it was on the fly, basically, or actually it was being sent by uh, node one, obviously node one would try to use uh, some, uh, some uh, high speed internet connection in order to speed up dissemination of blocks, uh, obviously. Okay, uh, then nevertheless, it is possible that such a fork occurs. So basically both block uh, node one and node three succeeded in hashing and they added the corresponding blocks uh, to the top of the blockchain. So now, uh, and obviously node three is starting to disseminate this as well. So now uh, there are two views of the blockchain, uh, depending on which node receives what first. So there are other nodes. Some of them first receive a block from node one, others receive a block from node three. So this is a common part of the blockchain, each one referring to the previous one. The oldest is Genesis block, you remember, all down to Genesis block of 2009. But with the only difference that either we have a, a node one block here, or we have a node two, a node three block here. So what does it mean? This situation is called a fork, not in the code base, but it is a fork in the blockchain, in the, in, in the state of the blockchain. Right? So how is it resolved? It is resolved in the following way. For the moment, uh, all nodes would, uh, because they would receive both actually blocks uh, N1 and N3, they don't really know which of them is valid. So they would have to continue maintaining both of them. So from now on, each node including by the way, N1 and N3. Node one still doesn't know, okay, it was slightly before, uh, probably before N3 in uh, hashing its block, or maybe not. Or maybe just N3 was ahead and just N1 received it a bit late. And that's why it had time to complete its own block. So all blocks having received, uh, we, we would assume that uh, there are only two candidates uh, candidate blocks and one and, and three, possibly more, uh, they would need to continue with different versions of the blockchain. For how long? Well, they would use both. And now uh, suppose that another node had mined another block, for example, N101. 
and this N101 precisely comes on top of N3 rather than N1, because obviously each block refers to the hash of the previous block, and that's how a chain is formed. And this configuration N101, N3, and so on is sent to all other blocks. In which case, there is now a winner because N3 serves as a basis for N101. So in the protocol of um, our uh, blockchain network, there is a precise rule for resolving the forks. Otherwise, the forks would stay forever and uh, the state of our network, uh, of our blockchain would split and split and split and split. No, it wouldn't split anymore. So because N101 is on top of N3, it is considered that there is a more work altogether in this chain N101, N3 and the previous ones at that moment. So all nodes upon receiving N101 on top of N3, they would now, uh, can you hear me because I got a slight interruption in the network. Okay, uh, they would now abandon this. N3 is a clear winner because there is an N101 on top of it. Would it be possible that again some kind of collision occurs and there would be another block N521 uh, which would be on top of N1? And uh, in that case, both actually of them are extended. Yes, it is possible. It is possible that both uh, forked chains are extended, but it is extremely, extremely, extremely improbable. A vast majority, you can just do some kind of probabilistic computations and you can see that a vast majority of forks would only have length one, so a common base and then uh, extended by different blocks uh, in one step. And then uh, because the temporal separation between the blocks is long enough, uh, you would have uh, this fork resolved, one chain abandoned and uh, another chain extended and now accepted by the majority of blocks. Uh, again, uh, the fact that N1, for example, is now abandoned doesn't mean that all transactions uh, which were put in N1 are lost because most of the transactions which are in N1 are also in N3. They are not identical, but probably most, most of transactions are in N3. So that's how, in general, uh, this uh, fork resolution works. It is, uh, first of all, hashing is proof of work. And then in the protocol, there is a longest, largest amount of work, uh, which wins. By largest amount of work, it's not uh, just how many hashes uh, had to be computed, because you don't know uh, whether, for example, you iterate over your nonce values uh, sequentially, or maybe you have some kind of uh, magic crystal, so you immediately arrive at uh, the right hash, who knows? It is just by how many blocks are uh, on top of uh, the common basis. So if there are uh, two blocks here on top of this blockchain and only one block uh, here on top of, uh, again, the common base, then uh, the longest one uh, in terms of the number of blocks wins. So this is the winner. Obviously, what we introduced informally now needs to be put onto some formal basis. You would definitely be interested in, let's say, mathematical probability of uh, having long forks. You would be interested in uh, a theoretical possibility that, for example, uh, the state would not converge at all. 
let's say each uh, of them would be extended by 100 and still not resolved. But this is extremely, extremely, extremely improbable. Why is it improbable? Uh, why is it improbable? Uh, it is improbable. What, why, why do I think actually, uh, you see everything we are doing here is probabilistic and that must be emphasized. So for example, convergence of uh, blockchains after a fork occurs probabilistically with very high probability it occurs only after one level. Why? So what is important actually? I have mentioned it several times, but I would now like to hear still uh, uh, your, your, your answer uh, about that. So why is it that important? Uh, what uh, is the most important factor which uh, helps the blockchain to converge? Maybe the period of time. Yes. Uh, with average period of time between two blocks. Yes, you are absolutely right. It is just a very unimpressive factor, which is a temporal separation between the blocks, which make the whole thing work. Otherwise, if uh, the time between the time required for dissemination of a block is comparable to the time required for, on average, a certain node to generate a new block, to, to, to hash a new block. Now we see uh, it is actually seconds to disseminate and 10 minutes to hash. So really it is basically two orders of magnitude difference. And this probabilistically uh, mean that the probability of a collision, if it exists for one level, it becomes infinitesimally small uh, for two levels. Okay, so mere temporal separation. And that's why, uh, had any one of you done any uh, Bitcoin transactions, really just sending money, using Bitcoin. No? Okay. Uh, if you did, you may note that most recipients would consider that the money have finally arrived after so-called three confirmations. So what does it mean, three confirmations? It means that Suppose that your monetary transaction is here. Here you are sending money to the United States. Not via a bank, but via a blockchain. So this block was hashed, another block was hashed, and yet another block was hashed. This is considered to be three confirmations, including the original block in which your transaction came. This is practically irreversible which means that it is extremely, extremely improbable that there is a separate chain which does not contain your entry, for example, another one based on N1, based on N1, which uh, is maintained by some node as a fork, and then eventually uh, yet another block would come first on top of that one rather than this one and would override your uh, transaction in N3. In general, just you know, very generally speaking, no, uh, none of the transactions at all in the blockchain are final. Maybe only the transactions which are put into Genesis block because it is just one is absolutely final. All other transactions in theory, could be overridden by other transactions. 
But for example, if someone wants to override a transaction which uh, is somewhere here, what do they need to do? They need to start a fork based on this, on this, for example, particular block. Okay, you can do it. So you basically start hashing a block based on uh, some other block deep into existing blockchain. Even suppose that you have succeeded with that. You send it to all others. But those all others would not accept it because they already know that, uh, okay, you added just one level to uh, that transaction, whereas there are other blockchains with many, many more new levels already on top of it. So by the blockchain protocol, they would be rejected. So in order to really override those blocks, you need to assemble the computational power which would allow you in a quick succession to hash uh, a successor of this block, then its own successor, then its own successor, and so on, in order to be able to override the whole sequence of blocks after that, which is absolutely impossible because even with, I would say, average, and average means very big power of mining farms, you on average can do it only once in 70 days. So if you really try for whatever reason to override an existing transaction, uh, which is two blocks deep, you would need on average to uh, perform 140 days of effort. Even if you succeed in doing that, in the meantime, there would be a huge number of other blocks which already extend the current accepted deemed valid blockchain. Therefore, probabilistically, although it is possible, but it is absolutely impossible in practice. Actually, three confirmations, so basically your transaction uh, coming into a given block and then two more blocks on top of it, are absolutely enough uh, for uh, success of your transaction. Uh, in general, it would be enough actually to wait for one confirmation for one block is hashed, uh, being hashed, and many recipients uh, of small funds, if for example, you pay for the cup of coffee uh, with Bitcoins, in some countries you can uh, do that. Uh, they wouldn't need to wait for 30 minutes. Just 10 minutes is enough, or uh, they would just see that uh, your transactions is inserted with a sufficiently high transaction fee into uh, a queue and would still accept it because even if it is not even in a block, because they know that it would come into probably most of blocks. And even if that block is overridden, uh, it would still be in a winning block. Okay, so that's how it works. Any questions so far, please? Okay, if no questions so far, we will move to a new topic. So we will consider our protocols in general. Uh, from Monday, we'll study Ethereum. But before we do that, let us discuss uh, having Bitcoin's blockchain now as an example let us discuss some general properties of uh, our blockchain. So general blockchain properties or oh, distributed ledger. So, first of all, a little bit about classification. Distributed ledger systems, well, or distributed ledger technologies, but I would use the term systems because we are referring to some uh, working deployed systems through which you can make transactions. 
So first of all, some, some, some classification. Um, first of all, they could be public or private. There is also another class which is semi, uh, semi private, but uh, for the moment, let's consider only public and private ones. So obviously Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are typically, Ethereum as well, are, are typically public ones. Which mean that, what does it mean? How would you characterize, uh, what does it mean that uh, your Bitcoin is a public blockchain or a public distributed ledger system? This means Everyone is absolutely free to, first of all, download the software which implements the node. Well, first of all, it means protocol in the public spec. Public protocol spec. If it is a public protocol spec, this typically is implemented by open source software. Okay. Because it is open source software, everyone can deploy it. May I ask you in your lab sessions, have you deployed a blockchain node? I think there was such uh, such a lab exercise, so you would be deploying your blockchain node on uh, your local machine, and observe how it works. Actually, there was a task where we uh, could not deploy the node itself, but just play with the interface. Okay, okay. So you know how it works, but in general, it is perfectly okay and easy to deploy your node. Obviously, when you deploy a node, it would take uh, a little while, uh, maybe about one hour, to download the whole blockchain. And the size of this blockchain so far is about several gigabytes. But you know, hard disks are large nowadays. So spending uh, a few gigabytes of your hard drive downloading the whole Bitcoin blockchain is not prohibitive. So you can deploy a node. And most importantly, your own node can freely communicate with all other peers. That's very important. With network peers, which means you don't need to provide any credentials. You don't need to ask any admin to give you uh, a login or password in order to participate in this public Bitcoin network. Your node is deployed and it starts working, also listening to other nodes and possibly sending transactions to other nodes which immediately results in a question. <clears throat> so what if you deploy some kind of malicious node, which, uh, for example, uh, deliberately sends erroneous malformed transactions or erroneous blocks, or uh, in some other way, trying to uh, interfere with the protocol. What do you think would, do, would happen in that case? In general, that's possible, <clears throat> but because each node implements a very thorough multi-level validity checks on all incoming data, and those validity checks are relatively cheap. In general, they are much, much, much cheaper than hashing a new block. 
then uh, you can very easily see that uh, legitimate nodes, in particular mining nodes, which uh, can do hashing, they do have enough uh, computational resources also to thwart uh, those malicious attacks. Whether some kind of really distributed denial of service attack uh, is possible on the whole Bitcoin network, which would, for example, swamp legitimate nodes with completely uh, invalid uh, input uh, like transactions or blocks. Uh, this may or may not be possible, but it uh, didn't happen as yet. And in general, uh, there are reasons to believe that uh, precisely due to A, uh, very thorough and relatively inexpensive checks, and B, uh, sheer computational power available for mining nodes, uh, such a distributed denial of service attack on the whole Bitcoin network, in that case you would need to attack, uh, let's say 10,000 of mining nodes, uh, is absolutely impractical. But in theory, it may be possible. So that's how this public uh, network works. And because it is public, then really you need to uh, employ heavy duty uh, consensus algorithms like uh, consensus of uh, proof of work consensus uh, in the Bitcoin network. So in this case, we have heavy duty consensus precisely for this reason because you need to make sure that the overall system is stable in order to secure it it does require uh, a lot of in this case uh, computational power should the average separation between the blocks be made smaller then we would immediately have much more race conditions uh, race conditions between uh, each nodes, more forks, more uh, lengthy forks, not with one level, but for example, with multiple levels, eventually more load, uh, exponentially more load actually, uh, because once a fork occurs and uh, then on top of uh, each branches of this fork, there are possible other forks and so on, uh, then uh, this would be uh, exponential growth of forked, uh, branches of your network before of, of your blockchain before uh, they converge again. So heavy duty consensus uh, is required in this case, which unfortunately limits the throughput, uh, the overall throughput of those public uh, blockchains. So we must say that uh, there are possibility, uh, there are possible throughput limitations. And that's why designing a public blockchain, which at the same time allows for high throughput is a very, very challenging exercise. Bitcoin is definitely not one of them, yet it works and it remains uh, the number one cryptocurrency nowadays. Okay, now private blockchains. Private blockchains are opposite to public ones, so everything could be private. Uh, the protocol spec could be private, you do not even need to release it to the public, it might not be an open source implementation. Uh, obviously not everyone can deploy a node, let's say only nodes from dedicated uh, pre-configured uh, IP addresses uh, would be accepted are uh, participating in the network before you can uh, exchange blocks would require some kind of authorization which is built into the protocol. Uh, there are many, many uh, differences between private and public uh, blockchain systems. Can you give any example of a private blockchain? How private blockchains do they? Or, yes. For example, banks may use this. Uh, some 
insurance companies are frequently using this right now. And uh, Indeed. from this, uh, I wanted to ask you a question. Please. Uh, for example, in a public field, uh, such chains like Bitcoin should use some heavy duty consensus algorithms, but in banks, the problem is that if we will utilize this, we will have to make such a high amount of uh, wastes like spending a lot of energy on proving not necessarily uh, important transactions, not, not like important, but uh, previously, like five years ago, we could just put a new transaction in a, in a database and everything is okay. But now we need to uh, proof of work, everything. We need to find a consensus and it appears to be much much more expensive and uh, what kind of consensus algorithms uh, may we use in this case exactly a very good question so indeed these are lighter consensus algorithms we are going to discuss them actually we'll start discussing them even i think in this lecture and proceed in full detail uh, in the next one on monday uh, indeed, uh, there would be not proof of work, but other types of consensus, uh, typically of some kind of a BFT type. BFT is Byzantine, why well, Byzantine we will see fault tolerance. You remember the Byzantine Empire? Those consensus algorithms are named after the Byzantine Empire. Why? I will explain. Uh, yes. And even more so, I can tell you, uh, let us, uh, I think we didn't discuss it last time, uh, but it is a very important understanding. Let us go a little bit into economics. Um, Initially, the international money were simply gold. So there was no dollar as the international currency, right? Uh, there are no cross-currency uh, transactions, currency exchanges, nothing of that kind. So all international payments, or indeed even local national payments, were gold-based, all right? For example, since uh, the ancient and medieval times. And then what is good about gold? Gold is inflation proof. So it is typically not suffering from any inflation because inflation occurs when a central bank uh, under control over certain maybe government, maybe parliament, uh, any, any state bodies starts printing excessive money excessive monetary emission. And then of course, the value of uh, the existing money in circulation drops. For gold, you can't really do excessive gold emission because you need to mine that gold, correct? So the gold is to be mined. And the cost of mining gold is substantial. The only case in history when actually uh, some inflation of gold and silver, more silver than gold actually, did occur, was in uh, the 15th, end of 15th and early 16th century Spain, when new American colonies were discovered and vast mm -hmm. supply of extra gold and silver became available and it was carried, uh, carried to Europe. Then the gold and silver supply increased dramatically and as a result uh, there was some inflation even of precious metals of gold and silver but in general it is not so but if you uh, if you see this from the economic standpoint then it appears that uh, what is one of our functions of, of uh, functions of money is to serve as an equivalent as a measure of equivalent 
for all goods and services in the national and international economy, all right? So if we use inflation-proof money, such as gold, in that case, what happens is that in economic terms, the amount of effort, the value is just the amount of effort in man hours, as we know from the 19th century economic theories, which still stand today. The amount of effort required to produce all those goods and services in the world economy would be equal to the amount of effort required to extract gold used to pay for those goods and services. Which means, by the way, that half of all effort of the whole mankind is simply wasted because half of effort is really for production of goods and services and the other half is for production of gold which simply serves as the measure of equivalent for the first one and by the way uh, such a situation is not that much hypothetical obviously in the modern world gold is not used as the universal uh, equivalence measure not used precisely for that purpose because if you do in the presence of global economy then half of your uh, of, of uh, effort in terms of man hours of the whole world population would be wasted on extracting the gold that's precisely the world economy moved away from the gold standard uh, sometime uh, in the 20th century when uh, the international trade became so widespread that it would become clear that uh, no amount of gold would be sufficient to cover all monetary transactions in the world okay yet there are some national economies in which gold payments are still very much in use that's for example the case for india and there is nothing good about this actually using gold as means of payment in general as we uh, realized uh, right now uh, would in fact be a very inefficient allocation of labor resources and in general it impedes economic growth so that's a bad idea uh, most of the countries have already moved away from uh, gold into paper money and electronic money, uh, which are not inflation proof, but uh, on the other hand, they are zero cost, next to zero cost to print. And that's why we are not wasting our resources for gold extraction anymore, in general, to, to use gold as means of payment. But now the tide changes. So for bitcoins or other proof of work consensus algorithms okay it is not gold but it is electricity it is computational power which eventually turns into electricity so to some extent you are right that if we replace our current monetary transactions with proof of work based uh, blockchains then from the economic standpoint we are back into the 19th century we are back into the gold era only uh, instead of gold we are now use electricity backed bitcoins so from uh, let's say the resource allocation and the efficiency of capital allocation point of view bitcoins are not that much progressive there is nothing that much good about them and that's why in order to uh, in order to uh, pave the way forward with cryptocurrencies this problem needs to be solved uh, bitcoin as it stands for now it cannot replace uh, the fiat currencies uh, like usd russian ruble and so on in the world simply because it is far too expensive to mine And that's a problem uh, so on the other hand if you move to private blockchains for example private banking blockchains 
there is even one in Russia. Uh, you know, a Russian central bank has developed, maybe we'll have time to discuss it in more detail, uh, a Russian national banking blockchain, which is called Master Chain. Have you heard about it, possibly? Master Chain. Master Chain is private. Uh, the code base is private. Uh, obviously, you need authorization to uh, enter the network. Uh, it is used only for interbank transactions, but in the future, it will be the basis of digital ruble, which means that we will be able to keep our ruble deposits not in a particular bank, but in a master chain blockchain, possibly some spin-off of master chain, uh, when part of it would become public. And this is, by the way, uh, an example of semi-private. It is private for now. It will become semi-private when mere mortals and ordinary citizens would be able to store uh, durable deposits in master chain which means that you make a deposit straight with the central bank rather than individual banks. But it is private still in the sense that uh, the whole technology is managed and administered and owned by a Russian central bank, whereas uh, Bitcoin is absolutely public. And this contradiction uh, seems to be, I think for the moment at least, unavoidable. So either you have a completely private, uh, you have a completely public uh, blockchain, but then it is based on a very heavy duty consensus, or you have some kind of private or semi-private with very much lighter consensus, but on the other hand, uh, it is governed still by a certain body. So uh, I'm sorry to say, but if at some point, if, if, if you put your savings into master chain, and at some point, a Russian central bank decides to discontinue this blockchain, then all is lost. Simply. Hopefully it would not be the case and there will be some legal uh, restrictions which uh, disallow this type of discontinuation, hopefully. But in general, that's what could happen with any type of uh, public, uh, sorry, of private network. Of private, I private have blockchain. a question. Yes. So the problem with this uh, private blockchain is that if some node is um, vulnerable, this is pretty much the same situation as uh, with private algorithms, uh, like crypto algorithms. Uh, you shouldn't invent your own uh, cryptological scheme because no one knows, uh, is it proof? uh like is it not vulnerable so if you for example right. some right. so, someone will uh, inject some vulnerable code in one node it will be not so hard to uh make a fork that is uh and continue to um Of course. Continue the proof of work uh, using more simpler algorithm. Not exactly proof of work, but just find the consensus. In, in general, yes. So if uh, someone finds vulnerabilities uh, in the code base, which is, you are absolutely right, more likely to happen if it is a private code base, which was not examined by the community, in particular the scientific community uh, in the large, then uh, safety of, uh, well, all dependability, safety, uh, uh, functional correctness, uh, security, and so on of uh, such a system uh, becomes, uh, becomes very much questionable. That's why it is a big problem. There are some ways of how this can be mitigated to some extent. So for example, uh, there are methods uh, which we may briefly discuss at the end of this course, which are called formal software verification. In this case, uh, using these formal software verification methods, you prove uh, the correctness of your code as a mathematical theorem. 
So it is not just verified by testing or by code inspection or by auditing or in, uh, in any other informal ways, but you do it uh, using computer logic systems and mathematically proof uh, correctness of certain properties. But even with using uh, formal software verification methods, uh, you can only verify those properties which you first identify. And so, for example, if you do a transaction, you ideally want to formally verify. And by the way, this is not a sole, call, a sole trivial property. Suppose that there is a transaction uh, from account A to B. So there was initial state of account A at point T1, so A1 and B1. And at point T2, there is a new state of our of our system, in particular with accounts A2 and B2, uh, account states A2 and B2. Suppose that we take some money from account A and transfer them to account B. Uh, Suppose that, well, uh, just name it. It's, it's very interesting, actually. Can you tell me, please, which invariant or invariants should always, irrespective to how this transaction is uh, carried out, which software is used, which smart contract, which uh, blockchain, uh, in any case, there must be some uh, invariant uh, regarding this transaction. The amount of money on both well wallets should be non uh, not negative first of all yes uh, ai bi at both actually times must be greater than zero that's true that's invariant number one i agree unless of course we allow over their own accounts and some kind of credit but let's say we do not allow that okay that's number one number two for i equals to one true. Yes. There is something else, you know, extremely, extremely important about this type of transaction. Maybe some kind of hash should match. Well, hash is only a technical means of achieving our transaction. These are just amounts, let's say in Bitcoins. That's how many Bitcoins are on account A at time T1 how much bitcoins at on account B at time T1, and these are amounts uh, on account A and B at time T2. We, what we do, we Maybe. do some transactions from A to B. So what happened then? Maybe the amount of, the total amount of money on both accounts should be less than total amount of bit, uh, coins at this particular time. Well, not less. Uh, I think uh, a very simple thing should happen. If, for example, we transfer some amount A, okay, then uh, first of all uh, from A, then uh, yes, of course, A should be less than or equal to A1. We can't transfer more than it used to be, okay. Then uh, the amount at A is decremented by A lowercase, so A2 is simply A1 minus A, whereas B2 is B1 plus A, because the amount A is sent from account A to account B, which means that, strangely enough, unexpectedly enough, A1 plus B1 is equal to A2 plus B2. The total balance on two accounts is unchanged as a result of a transaction. Well, minus transaction fees, but suppose that it is a private network, uh, in which there are no transaction fees. Transaction fees are zero. Transaction fees are zero. In this case, we have this fundamental property, A1 plus B1 equals to A2 plus B2. And interestingly enough, however simple this property looks like, it was sometimes violated. In the Ethereum network, uh, soon after it has emerged, uh, in uh, 2016, there was a major software fault. Uh, although the whole code base was public, it was examined, it was under scrutiny of many developers. Nevertheless, it did occur so that you could, in a smart contract, initiate an infinite recursion calling 
uh, functions indefinitely, get a stack overflow, and as a result, you could artificially create a situation when money are put on account B, but not yet removed from account A. Very nice transaction, isn't it? So situations like this are possible. And we do use uh, formal methods in order to guarantee that at least some fundamental transactional properties are preserved. Okay. Now I will just to, to conclude for today uh, and pave the way uh, into more detailed discussion of consensus algorithms uh, on Monday. I would say that uh, indeed there are uh, two types of uh, two major types of uh, consensus algorithms. So one type is called leader election. Leader election algorithms are more typical for public. blockchains and indeed leader election also occurs for bitcoin including bitcoin how uh, you could say all nodes are absolutely leader election sorry election. Um, all nodes are absolutely equivalent so there is no master node master or slave which leader how leader um, can you tell me please, so where is the leader uh, in our blockchain, in our Bitcoin blockchain? Why do we still say that the consensus algorithm for blockchain is based on the leader election principle? Because we need at least, uh, at least half votes for some particular decision and uh, to do this, uh, the easiest way is to so, elect a leader, which may be changed eventually. Uh, well, you, you are right. Changed eventually and actually means changed every 10 minutes on average. We have now seen uh, the blockchain, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain algorithm. So there is no predefined leader. Uh, it is not like, you know, US presidential elections. There is a local leader. I, I would say a temporal leader, the one who had completed hashing first is considered to be a leader, simply that. You have done hashing first, you are currently a leader. You are allowed currently being a leader to add your hashed block on top of the blockchain, simply that. Next time, uh, and actually uh, the leader was not even elected. You made yourself a leader by applying enough computational resources to come uh, with hashing first. Uh, next time, most certainly, because all uh, mining nodes are roughly of the same uh, of the same capacity, I would say roughly, of course, not exactly, because otherwise, if you are significantly, let's say, by an order or more uh, magnitudes uh, below uh, others, uh, then uh, hashing uh, would occur very, very, very infrequently for you, and uh, you simply lose more money on electricity, your electricity supply, than you earn uh, through hashing. Even now, actually, uh, if you earn 6.35, as we have seen, uh, 6.35 Bitcoin every 70 days, this is probably not a very good idea. Uh, because you need to pay a lot for electricity consumed over those 70 days. Uh, that's why all those mining farms are located typically in the regions, primarily in China, with very, very, very cheap electricity uh, through uh, electric, uh, hydroelectric power. Or if, uh, well, miners are also sometimes those who manage to illegally connect to power supply lines. In that case, of course, you can hash as much as you want and as long as you want. Uh, so the leader changes every 10 minutes. 
and it is not really election, it is someone proclaims itself a leader by disseminating, uh, disseminating a hashed block to the whole network. As we have seen, uh, it is possible that uh, at each particular moment, uh, at some particular moment, uh, there is more than one leader. Uh, like nodes N1 and N3, uh, you remember they used to be leaders uh, at the time when a fork occurs. But then uh, uh, another leader actually who mined the block N101 on top of one of them supplements both of them. So that's why we call it is leader election. And leader election really occurs on top of proof of something, proof of X where proof of X could be X uh, work. Okay, uh, there is another relatively popular, but much less uh, popular now. Uh, X could be stake. What is stake? Stake means uh, your share in uh, the system. So suppose that somehow you invested a lot of resources into building the whole uh, the whole system, which is still public, but you put a lot of resources, for example, in order to uh, run uh, the nodes, maybe uh, to contribute the software, maybe uh, some others. So you have some stake uh, into the system, so some interest in the system, interest contribution. And then it is considered to be more useful for you to abide the rules of the game. So to really do it uh, according to the protocol specified. Because if you invested heavily into the system and then you violate the rules, then other nodes would exclude you. And you lose your interest, you lose your stake. And that's why if you have a high stake in the technology somehow, then proof of stake is enough to uh, allow you to hash uh, transactions. Because if you do it maliciously, then you're excluded, you're losing your stake, and uh, basically you're at loss. Some, uh, still a minority of, of blockchains, they do this. So uh, by the way, uh, I suggest to you, do your own research and name which systems uh, nowadays use for example, proof of stake. Proof of work is still used by the vast majority of them. Uh, for example, one uh, crypto, uh, one blockchain uh, based on proof of stake is so called peer coin. But uh, please have a look uh, about others. Uh, instead of work uh, as uh, just computing hashes, uh, you can uh, make proofs of, for example, elapsed time which is basically same as work, but you just measure your CPU time. Uh, this is an Intel uh, initiative and Intel even contributed uh, to their own CPUs, uh, the hardware extension, which is uh, called uh, Software Guard uh, extension. Intel Software Guard extension, which guarantees uh, that uh, this elapse time cannot be forged. So proof of elapse time, sometimes it is proof of storage. So for example, storage or capacity, uh, in which case you contribute instead of your CPU time, you contribute some uh, hard disk resources in order to store some huge amount of data and by proving this, possibly providing a hash of that data, uh, you uh, again prove that uh, you legitimately uh, hash uh, a certain transaction and so on. So these are all proofs of whatever. Uh, the one who managed to prove that uh, he has done the work or has a stake or elapsed time or storage capacity becomes a current leader and that's how uh, a leader election consensus protocol works in general. And other family of uh, protocols which are called BFT, this Byzantine fault tolerance, much more typical for private or semi-private blockchains. So how Byzantine fault tolerance works in detail, we'll discuss in the next lecture on Monday. For the moment, we are done. Thank you.
Any questions? No. Thank you. See you on Monday then. Thank you. Bye.